Okay, but before we get into Romans chapter 8, I want to read something from Thessalonians. You know, Christmas season is coming, and it's almost on us. We've only got, if you realize, four more weeks before it's Christmas. And uh, instead of some of the heavy stuff that we learned, you know, we were just in the book of Hosea, and we learned how they didn't pay attention, didn't pay attention, didn't repent, and God took them over to Assyria, and he said, but someday they are going to come back to the land. Now, here I want to read this in 2 Thessalonians. You don't have to turn there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to start with verse 13. Now, this is talking about salvation. And many times we don't realize how blessed we are because of the salvation that was granted to us all by grace. And so I want to read this and emphasize some of these points here. This is verse 13 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is Paul is talking to the people of Thessalonica. And remember he started that church. He said, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Wherefore, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Now, we could easily read over that, but he said, because God, that's God the Father, the collective, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hath from the beginning, he means from the beginning of everything, the universe, because it says we were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. And so he said you were chosen to receive salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. He said God chose you to be saved and he's given you the power to be saved because he has given you the Holy Spirit in your life. And he says, and you, salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and belief of the truth. You believe the truth. The truth is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And he says, wherefore he called you by our gospel. And Paul is saying, I am so happy to see that when I preached, and you believed it, even though I preached simply, you believed it, accepted it, because the Holy Spirit was working in your life to help you believe and to receive. Now, I want to talk about salvation. What all salvation means. And sometimes we don't fully understand or appreciate what God has given to us in that word salvation. Now I've got a paper here I printed out on my computer. And this was from a fellow named Lewis Perry Chafer. He used to be, he was the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary in Texas. And he was there for many years until he passed on. And 
this is what he says. The word salvation is used in the Bible to indicate a work of God in behalf of man. In the present dispensation, which is the dispensation of grace, it's used, it's limited to his work for individuals only and is vouchsafed to them upon one definite condition. Too much emphasis cannot be placed on the fact that now, according to the Bible, salvation is the result of the work of God for the individual rather than the work of the individual for God, or even the work of the individual for himself. Eventually, the one who is saved by the power of God may, after that divine work is accomplished, do good works for God. For salvation is said to be unto good works. And those who believe are to be careful to maintain good works. Good works are evidently made possible by salvation. But these good works which follow salvation do not add anything to the all-sufficient and perfect saving work of God. He says, you can't do anything anything to merit your salvation. When we get into Romans, that's what Paul is going to say. He says, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I studied the law. I tried to do it until he got knocked off of his high horse because he was looking at the law as physical and he was trying to meet the law in this man's, but he said, there was something in him that said no matter how hard he tried, he could never achieve it. And then when you get into Romans 6, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, I want to do good and I can't do it. And he says, Who will deliver me from the body of this death? See, because the law, when it was given, it wasn't given to make men perfect because it couldn't. The law was spiritual. And we are carnal, we are fleshly. But the law was given so they would see no matter how hard they tried to keep the law, there's no way they could. You know, because they were thinking, okay, if I do this right and I do that right and this. But when Jesus came along, he said, look, you're going to the letter of the law. He said, but the intent of the law was greater than what you are reading into it. He said, because when it said, don't commit adultery, he says, you might say, oh, I never committed adultery. He said, but in your mind, if you even think of a woman in that way, you've committed it already. And he said, even if you think of something like stealing, like I wouldn't steal that cookie, but, you know, the thought of it, you know, he said, that's what it is. That's where you have to change your mind. At, in the scriptures, it says, by the renewing of your mind. So he's saying, the law could not make me change or help me change. It just shows that I needed a change. That's why he says at the end of chapter 6 in Romans and 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ I have the victory. And so he says that we have to ask Jesus to come into our life for salvation. You know, and he said that is the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, he says there's nothing we did. He says there's none that seeks after God. No, not one. But the Holy Spirit chooses. But we have to remember those that are believers were chosen in Him before the foundations of the world. And that's hard for us to comprehend. And we are not the only ones that have been chosen. 
back in the Old Testament, a lot of the Jewish people were chosen because it's from Abraham. It said when Abraham believed God, before he even had the circumcision to confirm it, he said it was accounted to him for righteousness. Even though he did many things wrong, where he lied about his wife and said it's my sister, and even though he killed many people and he rescued Lot from some other kings, and it says, because he believed God. And even when he was going to offer Isaac up as a sacrifice, he realized that God said through your seed, Isaac, is the world is going to be blessed. So you know, he was probably full of anxiety and turmoil as he was going up there thinking, well, God, you said it's going to be through him. If you kill him, I believe that you're able to raise him up in order to have the world blessed through him. So it was the faith of Abraham. That was before the law was given. The law was given 400, 500 years later, you know, and that's because God was appearing to the whole nation of Israel and he wanted them to see the power that he had, the might, the glory. And that's when he came down on the mountain. It was thick smoke and thunders and lightning and fire. And he wanted them to see that he was God. Put a fear in them so that they will know that he is the only God. But he's a God of love and compassion and mercy. So that's why he made a way of salvation. When he gave the, uh, took them out of Egypt through that blood sacrifice of the animal, well, those who believed in him, every year they would make those sacrifices and they were the ones who were in Abraham's bosom when Jesus was crucified and he went down these were the faithful believers in the Old Testament. And when Jesus was on the cross and he was crucified, the veil of the temple was torn. So God was saying, there, you don't need those sacrifices that could only cover your sins. They couldn't take them away, but they covered them until the perfect sacrifice came. When Jesus came and died on the cross, that curtain, the veil was torn from top to bottom, it wasn't tore from the bottom up, so it was not man's effort. It was God's effort saying, okay, now I made a way for you to approach me, and it's through my son. And then when Jesus was buried and he rose again, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he says, that we, through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, we can't you know, change our life to fit the law. The law says do this, do this, do this. And he says, it's impossible for me to do it. He says, reckon yourselves, and that's a good southern word, reckon. Reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin because he destroyed death and sin at the cross. Okay, and then he rose from, he says, so reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin but alive unto Christ. Now we're going to see there's different kinds of laws that are working here. But I just want to say some things that your salvation has accomplished for you. And sometimes we're not aware of what all it entails. And I'm going to read this. This is part it says, Talking about salvation, the larger use of the word, therefore, combines in many separate works of God for the individual. And these are the different works that are included in your salvation, such as atonement. The sacrifice was to cover the sins in the Old Testament to make atonement for their sins. Jesus was crucified on the cross to make the atonement for our sins. Then he says, he has given you grace. Grace is something you don't deserve. He said, but he gave you grace and not judgment. And so when we get into Romans 8, he says, There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So 
He made the atonement, then He gave you grace, and it says that He was the propitiation for our sins, meaning that He was the payment. You know, it says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And it says, the law showed me I could not keep it. And if I couldn't keep the law and I couldn't meet the high standard of God, I was as good as dead. And that's what Paul says. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But he paid it for you. That he was... He had to come down. He was born of a woman, not of the seed of the man, but he was born in flesh, you know, that he might destroy sin in the flesh. And now, then it says that he also has given us forgiveness. He is justification, means that he has forgiven us to the point is as though we never did do it. And then he says, imputation. He has imputed his righteousness and taken our sin. So he's imputed his righteousness. So when God sees us now, he sees us as perfect in Christ, even though we're still in this little time zone here, this time frame. And he says that he has given us regeneration. He said we were dead in trespasses and sins, but we have been made alive through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and he says and then we call out adoption now that here there's one way one word used in the hebrew for the adoption of a child that is not of your genealogy okay so you adopt maybe like i could adopt a child from africa but here he says that we have been adopted as sons, and we're going to see that in Romans. Sons, and then he says, he is sanctification. He sanctifies us. He sets us apart for service. So, these are the things it says. And then after that, he says, redemption. After he has given all of that, the atonement, the grace, propitiation, forgiveness, justification, imputation, regeneration, adoption, sanctification. He has redeemed us from the curse of sin. And he is going to glorify us. That's what he says over here. We can't comprehend everything. What he says here is that, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father which has loved us have given us everlasting consolation and hope through grace. The consolation means that you have all that comfort and that consolation is the Holy Spirit. If you look in the Greek it's an ekklesias. And that means that it is the comforter. It's one who's called there to help you in your times of need. Then, here is, here is a verse that says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not because it knew him not. He said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And now, here, when we get into Romans 8, we can turn there now. I want you to see this. He says in ver verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And then a lot of scholars feel that this next section was not really in the original text. But the copiers put it in to try to clarify but instead of clarifying it causes some concern that misunderstanding it says 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It's saying, if you're in Christ Jesus who walk after the flesh, you're still condemned. But that's not what it means. It means, for there who walk not after the flesh, the people who are not saved are still walking in the flesh. They are more concerned about things like a bigger house, a better TV, a new car, you know, or the next football game. And they're not really that concerned, so they are not saved. The person who has the Spirit of Christ is more concerned about spiritual things, you know. Are my children saved? Are they going to go to heaven? Do I pray for them, you know? And then, is God going to judge me and... Our concern is more spiritual of what God has done for us, not what I can do for myself or trying to work my way to heaven. Now, let's go down here a little bit. And he says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. He said there are two laws. The one was a written law. It says, the law is righteous, the law is holy, but I could not meet it because he said, the soul that sinneth that shall die. And so he said, there is a law of sin and death, but the law of the spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit, the law of the spirit of life. And it's because he said, when Christ was resurrected from the dead, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit that raised him. And that's the same we are when Paul says, Reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto Christ. And Paul, all through his epistles, says, Think on those things above. If anything is good, anything is right, anything is true, anything is good report, anything is right, think on these things. He says, For the renewing of your mind, you know, that you have to cleanse it. So we're constantly trying to Glorify God. Now we're coming up to a time where everybody's going to make New Year's resolutions. And he says, no matter how many times you can make a New Year's resolution, you know, we always break them. He said, so a lot of these self-help books <laughs> might make us better people in a way, but it doesn't give us any better standing in God's sight. What gives us better standing in God's sight is to be led by the Spirit and do the things that He wants us to do. And He has given us a consciousness that when we do wrong, we're rebuked by it. And then He says over in the epistles of John, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He's already forgiven all of your sins. And because all of your sins were future when he died. And so that sin is settled once and for all. But he's saying here, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And the thing here is that he's saying the flesh is weak. The law tells me what I need to do, and I just couldn't do it, and the law can't help me do it. But I needed a person. I needed someone. So Jesus paid the price. And you know, J. Vernon McGee, he, he's kind of funny sometimes. And he makes these little homey illustrations. And he, uh, But he puts down women sometimes. He says, you know, there's this lady that would be making a pot roast. And she puts the old pot roast into the oven. And then she leaves it there. And all of a sudden the phone rings and it's missed nosy body down the street and then she gets to talking and say have you heard this have you and for long you know they're talking so it's a long time that all of a sudden she smells the smoke in the kitchen and she runs and she i gotta go i said i got a roast in the oven and i smell the smoke it must be burning 
So she goes in and she says, oh, yeah, it's done, it's done, you know. And so she sticks in a fork to try to get out the roast, you know. And the fork is a type of loss. She sticks it in, but it couldn't. The roast is so done, the meat just falls apart. You know, and she can't get it out. He says, so what she does is she gets a big spatula and sticks it under the loaf and then pulls it out. And he says, that's the difference. The fork would represent, you know, the law. It couldn't get that roast out, is it? But that spatula was the power of the Holy Spirit that was provided, you know, and pulled it out. So that's what he was trying to say. That's a simple illustration but he's saying, just because it's there, it might not be the instrument to help you. You need something else. And that's why he had the Holy Spirit. Then, here he says, in verse 5, For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Where it says mind, it means they're thinking about it. Like a bigger TV, you know, or... How can I increase my 401k? And these are good as long as you're not constantly dwelling on it. You know, like during the Depression, when the stock market crashed, there were people jumping off of buildings and stuff, committing suicide because they had overextended themselves and they'd lost everything and their concern. And now, in this present time, <laughs> where everything is topsy-turvy, and a lot of people are becoming depressed, you know, to the place that, what should I do? What should I do? And he's trying to say, you know, trust in me. Trust in God. That's where our faith should be. Then, when we go through these difficult times, over here in verse 18, he says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, I'm going to stop a little bit early today, but I just want to leave on a positive note. And this is the positive thing. Is Paul starts off here in the chapter, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation. So nothing you can do if you belong to Jesus, he says your Savior, nothing you can do can make him love you more and nothing you can do could make him dislike you more because he is love. But here he says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be revealed. And we, we, have a hard time thinking about suffering as Paul knows suffering. Because Paul lived during the Roman time where they took Christians and strapped them to a pole and dipped them in tar and set them on fire. Now that's suffering. And he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time when he was speaking, you know, is not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. And When we stop to think, it says that we are, I think I passed over, yeah, look up here in uh, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, in the Old Testament, the Jewish people never dreamed of calling God Father. It was always Lord or God Almighty, you know. But here, he's saying, you can call him Father. That's what Jesus said when he was here. They said, teach us how to pray. And he said, this is how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven... And those disciples must have been blown away to think that they could call God the Father, the Almighty One. And that's hard for us to realize. But here he opens this chapter, which says, there is no condemnation. And then down here in verse 28, he says this. 28. And we know 
that all things work together for good for those that love God, to them that are called according to the purpose. His purpose. Not our purpose. His purpose. And the thing, we say, everything. You mean when my roof blows off my house in the tornado? That's working for my good? Yes, we might not see it now, but down the road we will. If I have a flat tire in the middle of expressway during rush hour, oh, how is that? He says, I am working in you both to do of my good pleasure. And, you know, it says that you have need of patience. So we can rest assured that there's no condemnation to us. Even if we lose our temper and say, ah, blah, 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 blah. you know, we try not to do that. But that is already covered under the blood. So there's no condemnation. Everything is going to be working out for our good. And the most important thing is down here in verse 35. He says, For who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things... We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that's important for us to realize. There's no condemnation. We're not going to stand up there and he's going to say, guilty, get out of here. He's going to say, welcome home. And then when we do the good works, after we're saved, we will get rewards for it. And everything is going to work for good for those that love the Lord. And then he says, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. So if God allows it to come into your life, it means it's for a purpose. And he's trying to round off the rough edges. So, I want to talk a little bit more about in uh, chapter 9 later. But just go back here to chapter 8 and look at verse 29. And this ought to make you feel good. This is the past tense already done for whom he did foreknow you he knew you before the foundations of the world he knew you he also did predestinate you predestinated you for what to be conformed to the image of his son not necessarily you're going to look like jesus but it means that you're going to have the same thought pattern, the same mind, the same love, the same compassion and to meet the needs of others. It's to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. And he says, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, he justified and whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, in the presence of God Almighty, we are already glorified. Because he knew how many sins we were going to commit. He already died for them. And then he sees us as righteous. So anything we do now for him is a reward that we will receive when we stand in his presence. So the sin question has already been settled when we accepted Christ as our Savior. Then when he says, Paul says later on in other epistles, work out your own salvation. It doesn't mean to work for your salvation. He just means that now you are saved. You're a brand new babe in Christ. He says, now... I want you to take step by step. He says, as newborn babes 
desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow by there. And then later on as you're growing and you fall short, he says, cleanse yourself by the washing of the water of the word. And remember when Peter, you know, Jesus was in the upper room and Jesus was going to wash his feet. And he said, oh no, Lord, not my feet. And the Lord said, well, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. And then I'm sure old Peter said, ha, not only my feet, Lord, wash my whole body. He said, you're clean. He said, but, and Jesus was giving him a demonstration of humility, you know, because he thought, man, Lord, you don't want to wash my feet. <laughs> but then he humbled himself. You know, a lot of times we don't want to humble ourselves. We go, I can do this on my own. And the important thing to know is that God loves you. And He doesn't want anything to come into your life that's going to destroy your faith. He wants to increase your faith. So, dwell on that and realize that He loves you so much. That's what Paul said. He loved you so much that He died for you on the cross. And He's not going to die for you for nothing. So...